Hello, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Naming Ionic Compounds. This is part one. So in the last lesson, we learned how to take uh, 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 two elements on the periodic table, a metal, which is on the left-hand side of the table, and a non-metal, which is on the right-hand side of the table, and how we can, when these guys come together, we figure out what ions they want to make based on gaining or losing electrons, and then from that, we learn how to write the chemical formula down, or the, the formula unit, the empirical formula for that uh, ionic compound. In this lesson, we're going to transition to naming these ionic compounds. We have a whole series of lessons here, and in this one, we're gonna be naming the very simple ionic compounds. Now, the, the, one that you, the one that you know in the back of your mind is sodium chloride, right? Because sodium is over here in column one, or group one, on the periodic table, and chlorine, or chloride, is over here in this column. And so you already know, based on previous lessons, that chlorine wants to gain one electron to look like argon, and sodium wants to lose an electron to look like the outer electron configuration of neon. So one wants to gain, one wants to lose. And the way we say it, sodium chloride is the name of table salt, right? So the way you name these ionic compounds is very, very simple. The first element is the metal on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and you just say the word as it, as it is printed, sodium, and there's no change to it the chlorine becomes chloride. You need to get used to that I-D-E ending, and that is what we use when we put it together in the ion form into a compound. So chlorine becomes chloride. Fluorine becomes fluoride. Oxygen becomes oxide. That's a, another one that you know, you know of for sure because you've probably heard of oxidation or, or, or oxides, you know, uh, and so on. Bromine becomes bromide. Iodine becomes iodide. So when we put the IDE at the end, it's the name of the corresponding ion after it gains an electron. Now, when we wrote our ions down before, I did put that in there. The uh, cations, we, we just listed them here. But uh, over here, whenever I showed you these guys, I said the words out loud. And I said, this is hydride, this is fluoride, this is chloride, this is bromide, this is iodide. And then we had the other uh, polyatomic ions, which we're gonna use a little bit later. In this lesson, we're not doing anything with polyatomic ions. So sodium chloride is the one that everybody knows. Let's go and solve a few more to see how to handle them. Let's take a look at NaBr. How do we name this guy? Uh, well, this is a, a ionic compound because sodium is a metal and bromine is a non-metal. If you're not sure or you don't remember, sodium is on the left, bromine is on the right. So they are going to form an ionic compound. So what did we say? We said just like sodium chloride, the first uh, element here is just uh, written as its name. So it's gonna be written as sodium, no changes. And bromine becomes bromide, so bromide. Right, so that's the name of this compound. So if you see sodium uh, bromide, you know it's an ionic compound because uh, uh, the IDE indicates this is the, the negative ion and we don't make any changes to the first word for the, uh, for the metal there. Now, since we're doing this and we're, we're, we're in chemistry and we're trying to learn, let's just double check each of these as we go and make sure that the ionic compound I'm writing down makes sense. All right, sodium and bromine. So we'll just go through them as we go here. So sodium is gonna get a charge of plus one, losing an electron. Bromine's gonna get a charge of minus one. And so if I were to write the charges down, I would have a plus one and a minus one. And from the crisscross that we have done before, the subscripts will be one and one. So this indeed matches up. We've already done that skill in a previous lesson. We're just kind of like reviewing it for sanity check as we go here. So let's talk about R, B, subscript two, O. So what is Rb on the periodic table? Rb on the periodic table is rubidium. Again, it's in column uh, or in group one, same as sodium and potassium. And uh, the O, of course, is oxygen. So it's an ionic compound because it's a metal plus a non-metal like this. And so what do we do? We write down the element name, rubidium, for the first one. We don't make any changes to it. So it's R-U-B-I-D-I-U-M. No changes, rubidium, but then the oxygen becomes an ion name, which is an IDE, oxide. So the name of this thing is rubidium oxide. That's how you would say it. Now let's double check and see if it makes sense. So the rubidium, according to the periodic table, the rubidium should have a charge of plus one since it's in this column and the oxygen should have a minus two, trying to gain two electrons in this column. 
So if this is a plus one and this is a minus two, when we do the crisscross, the two comes here and the one comes here, and that's exactly what we have, so it makes sense that this would be the ionic compound formed by those two elements. Let's take a look at Ca, calcium, plus sulfur, right? On the periodic table, calcium is on the left-hand side, so it's a metal, and sulfur is on the right-hand side, and it's a non-metal, so this would form an ionic compound. So uh, calcium would form a plus two, uh, and sulfur would form a minus two ion based on their uh, columns, as we have learned before, trying to look like a noble, uh, a noble gas. So what would we name this thing? Since we know it's ionic, the first element is just written as is, calcium. And the sulfur becomes the oxide name, or the, uh, the ion name, which we call sulfide. See how they have, uh, they always have these uh, IDE endings. So calcium sulfide, that would be the right answer. Does it make sense that this is correct? Well, we just said that calcium would take on a, a, two, a, a positive two charge and sulfur would take on a negative two charge. And we just said that because calcium is going to lose two electrons to look like argon and sulfur is going to gain two electrons to try to look like argon as far as its electron electrons in the outer shell there. So when we do the crisscross like this, we're going to get Ca2S2. Now you might say, well, this is different than this, so something's wrong. But then we remember that for ionic compounds, we are looking for the lowest ratio in the formula unit. So uh, yeah, it is a ratio of two calciums to two sulfurs, but that's the same thing as a ratio of one to one. So you divide both of these numbers by a common, uh, a common number, just like a fraction. You can divide both by two and we get one and one. So this is the correct formula unit there. So we're just doing a sanity check to make sure that the ionic compounds are forming the way that we expect. Next, let's take it Al and then I sub three, aluminum and iodine. So, where is aluminum on the periodic table? It's over here, so you might think it's a non-metal, but actually the, the stair-step line is here, so it, it is a metal, actually. And so it's going to try to lose one, two, three electrons, and uh, the iodine is right here. It's gonna gain one electron. So it is a metal plus a non-metal. What would the name of this compound be? Well, we just write the first element, aluminum and the iodine becomes iodide, iodide, right? So when you see the iodide, that tells you that it's the, uh, it's the ion form, and when you read something like this, you know that it's a metal plus a non-metal, so this is an ionic compound, aluminum iodide. All right, let's just double check. The aluminum we said wants to form a plus three charge, the iodine wants to form a minus one charge, so the one comes here and the three comes here, so this does make sense for the correct ionic compound. All right, now we're gonna go in reverse. Here I've been giving you the formulas, the formula units here, uh, and then we've been writing down the names. Here we're gonna switch so that I write the names down and we go backwards. So we have strontium fluoride. Now you know that this is ionic compound for a couple of reasons. First of all, strontium, once you get a feel for the periodic table, you, you recognize that it is a, um, a, a metal on the periodic table. And here is strontium. So uh, again, after a while, you know it's a metal, so it's a metal. And you know that fluoride is associated with fluorine, and fluorine is a non-metal. So you know that that is going to form an ionic compound. And you can check and say that strontium wants to lose two electrons, so it would be a plus two, and fluorine wants to gain one, so it would be a minus one. So what we can do is write down what we think this guy is gonna be, strontium fluoride. Well, we know that it's gonna be SR, and we know that it's gonna be F, because we get these from the names, and then we go to the periodic table and write down the charges. Strontium wants to form positive two, and fluorine wants to form minus one. Strontium is in this column, so it wants to form positive two, losing two electrons. Fluorine wants to gain one electron. And so once we do the crisscross here, what we get is we get strontium, with a subscript one and fluorine with a subscript two. So we get SRF2. So given the name, we've gone backwards and we've written down the ionic compound. All right, good. Next one. Let's take a look at aluminum. Uh, you can call it selenide or selenide, however you wanna pronounce that. S-E-L-E-N-I-D-E. -E -E. 
So you suspect that this is an ionic compound because you know aluminum is a metal and selenide, selenide has uh, the IDE ending. So you know that it's a negative ion. They always have these IDE endings. Well, let's go to the periodic table and see where they live. So aluminum, of course, is right here. And selenium is, where is selenium? Right here, S-E. So it's A-L-S-E. So we write down A-L and S-E. Now, what would the ion charge be on aluminum? Aluminum is right here. And of course, it could gain all these electrons, but it's not going to do that. It'd rather just lose one, two, three electrons and look like the outer shell of neon. So it's going to have a three plus charge when it loses three electrons. The selenium is going to want to gain two electrons to look like, to look like krypton, the outer shell of krypton. So it's going to have a negative two. And then when we do the crisscross, what we're going to get is aluminum with a subscript two and selenium with a subscript three, Al2Se3. Now, I haven't been saying it out loud, but every time we write these, these formulas down, we need to check, are they in the lowest ratio? Two to three is the lowest ratio. I cannot divide each of these by a common number to make them smaller. Same thing with one and two. I cannot uh, uh, combine or to do, uh, to divide those to make them simpler. But if you were to get something like this, two and two, you can divide both by the common number of two and you get something simpler. And so this is the correct formula unit for that guy. All right, so that was aluminum selenide or selenide, however you want to say that. Uh, we only have a couple more. Let's talk about potassium nitride. Nitride. All right, so you know that uh, potassium, of course, is a metal on the left-hand side, and nitride, you might think it's one of those polyatomic ions, but actually it's just the ion form of nitrogen. Nitrogen, nitride. So potassium is K and nitrogen is N. So let's write it as K, the element K and the element N. Now, what is potassium want to do? It wants to lose an electron, so it'll be a plus one. And nitrogen wants to gain one, two, three, so it'll be a negative three. So here we have a, I'll switch colors. Potassium wants a plus one and uh, this nitrogen is negative three. So when we do the, the crisscross here, what we get is potassium with a subscript of three and nitrogen with a subscript of one. So K3N, and this is the final answer. All right, let's move along to our very last one. Here we have magnesium phosphide. So again, you might think this phosphide is like some kind of polyatomic ion, but it's not. Phosphide is associated with phosphorus. So oxygen, oxide, nitrogen, nitride, I iodine, iodide, phosphorus, phosphide, right? That's, that's how that works. And magnesium, of course, is a metal. So magnesium has the symbol Mg and phosphorus has the symbol P. So magnesium is where? Right here. It's going to want to have an ion charge of losing two electrons, so positive two. And phosphorus is right here. It wants to gain one, two, three. So it'll have a negative three charge. So magnesium wants to have a plus two and phosphorus uh, negative three. And so once we do this crisscross like this, what we do or what we get is Mg. The three comes here and the phosphorus is two. And so here we go. Now, we've mentioned this uh, many times, but just to absolutely drive it home, this crisscross thing isn't magic, okay? The reason it works is because the formula, the, the electric force is millions and millions and millions of times stronger than gravity. It's incredibly strong. So if there's ever a net charge where you have a negative and positive, they're just gonna attract together and basically neutralize each other because once you have a negative and positive uh, together, then uh, it, it neutralizes from a distance, it neutralizes the, the charge that you had. So in this case, if we know that each magnesium is plus two, uh, and, and if we know that each phosphorus is negative three, if we arrange it like this, if we have three of these magnesiums, the total charge, three times two, would be positive six. So because there's three of these magnesiums, each with a charge of plus two, this total charge is plus six. But here, if we have two phosphorus, each with a charge of negative three, this one is a charge 
of uh, negative six overall because you have uh, two phosphorus each with negative three. So a plus six and a minus six from a distance when you add them together is gonna look like a zero. And so once it's attracted in the formula unit in this ratio that we've constructed on the board, then from a distance it looks like zero and so it's not gonna attract anything else. So everything forms up to try to form a neutral formula unit and the reason they do that is not because they want anything or have desires, it's because the electric force is so strong that it pulls stuff in until it's neutralized. Same thing here, we know, let's take a look at this one. Strontium wants to have a charge of plus two and fluorine negative one. So if we have one of these strontiums, then the total charge here would be plus two. But if we have two of these fluorines, the total charge here would be minus two. So from a distance, it all looks like a zero charge, so it stops attracting uh, more into this formula unit and you just get a regular repeating pattern of one strontium to two fluorine atoms in that formula unit. So here we've introduced the idea of naming ionic compounds. In all of these cases, we've just taken the metal plus the non-metal. The way you name it is the metal just retains its name straight off the periodic table and the non-metal gets an IDE ending and you put them together and that's how you know you have, when, when you just read the word, you know it's an ionic compound because of the way it's named. And after you see it enough times, you'll understand that and just kind of know that. So I'd like you to solve all of these. Follow me on the part two. We'll get a little more practice with naming ionic compounds.